'Twas the night before E3, and all through HQ, not a creature was stirring, hush hush Shigeru. Not a soul round the world knew of what lay in store. A game, yes it was, but also so much more. You could make your own levels and share them online. No game was quite like it, t'was truly sublime. But how did this wondrous game come to be? Well, let us find out if you'll just come with me. Hi there, welcome to Thomas Game Docs. Excuse my poetry at the beginning there, I'm getting into the festive spirit. <laughs> So, in case you've been living under a rock for the last few months, it's only a few days until the release of Super Mario Maker 2. But stop for a second and think back to 2014, because while now the idea of creating your own Mario levels seems pretty ordinary, back then when Nintendo showed off this Mario Maker game where you could make your own levels and share them online, that seemed totally bizarre. And so that begs the question, how did this game even come to be? Well. Let's take a look, shall we? Mario Maker got its roots from a pretty unsuspecting place within Nintendo, the Tools Team. This team was responsible for, as the name would imply, developing tools that game designers at Nintendo could make use of when developing the games themselves. This team had previously developed the handwriting recognition that made Brain Age for the DS possible. But for their next challenge, they wanted to develop a tool which made it easier for Nintendo's level designers to quickly and easily create Mario levels, test them, experiment with them, ultimately creating the best possible level that they could make. Before long, the team got this tool running on the PC. And that was where it stayed, until the team heard of a little thing called the Wii U. This was to be Nintendo's fancy new console, and it had a trick up its disc tray. The GamePad. This unique controller was more akin to an iPad than a Wiimote, allowing for two-screened gameplay. This, coupled with the fact that this GamePad came equipped with a touchscreen and stylus, meant that the Tools team instantly saw the potential for moving their level creation tool, which happily resided on the PC, onto the Wii U. Once they had it up and running, the team soon realised that they had something great on their hands. Countless hours were spent testing and creating levels, and sharing them with others on the team. And so the team approached Nintendo veteran and producer Takashi Tezuka, suggesting that the level creation tool be developed into an actual game. Now, separate from this, Tezuka had been doing some thinking of his own. For years, he had been wanting to develop a follow-up to the SNES title Mario Paint. Now, in Mario Paint, players could, well, paint, but also create short animations, compose music, swat flies. It was a surprisingly full-featured game, and Tezuka had long been wanting to develop some kind of sequel to it. When he saw Nintendo's Wii U console in development, he knew that the system's touchscreen and stylus combo would be absolutely perfect for a new Mario Paint entry. And so, when the Tools team showed up with their level editor tool, Tezuka knew straight away that these two ideas could be combined into a really great experience. In his words, there are lots of drawing utilities in the world, but does everybody like drawing? Not necessarily. In order to make a Mario course, all you have to do is put different parts together. It's not as difficult or out of reach as drawing is. However, the Tools team themselves didn't have high expectations. They told Tezuka, well, because all we're going to do is create an editor, we probably won't do it as a big piece of packaged software when it may be at a lower price point. However, Tezuka responded, no, this is going to be a full-sized piece of software. What Tezuka really enjoyed about Mario Paint were the weird little flourishes in the software, the hidden features that you might never even discover. He felt it was enjoyable just interacting with the software itself, and he wanted, above all, to incorporate this aspect into the new level creating game. Now, one of the first people that Tezuka brought onto this new project was director Yosuke Oshino. Well, I say director, this was actually his directing debut. Up until then, he had been a humble programmer, working on titles like New Super Mario Bros. Wii and Nintendogs and Cats. For this new game, though, he would ascend to the throne of directing, if you will. Exciting. Now, the first thing the team did was look at the tool team's tool and decide what needed changing. Their conclusion? Not much. 
According to Tezuka, the first prototype that we saw and played with was actually really beautifully designed and simple and easy to understand. We made a point to keep that same aesthetic and style. That's not to say it didn't see any changes though. Later in development, as the project went on to balloon in scope, the team were careful not to let the interface become too cluttered, and they looked for any possible opportunity to get rid of buttons wherever they could. This helped to prevent the game from becoming overwhelming to players. Now, if you'd like to see what the software was looking like early on, the closest you'll probably get is Nintendo's first ever trailer for the game. Now, I'm sure this wasn't exactly how it looked when the tools team showed it off to Tezuka, but I'm willing to bet it's not that far off. Now, early on, the team knew they wanted to add an online aspect to the game, allowing users to upload their levels for the world to play. According to Tezuka, when you make a course, you naturally want someone to play it. That's the point of it. Of course, if your friend makes a course, you're going to want to play it, right? And so he and director Oshino decided that an online aspect would be necessary. Devising a system to allow good levels to surface would be easier said than done though. Although they did consider fully integrating the game with Miiverse, Nintendo's own social network, they eventually decided to build a brand new level finding solution themselves. This eventually took the form of the Course Finder. Now, one aspect that the team ended up discussing at length was how the physics should work. You see, although you might not remember a great difference, each Mario game's physics work differently. They can actually differ quite significantly at times. Here's a comparison of just the different jumps, put together by Reddit user Argarok X. As you can see, the first game had quite a short stubby jump, Mario 3 had a sort of upside down V, Mario World had more of an upside down U, and then New Super Mario Bros U just sort of refined upon that. Now, the team initially weren't sure whether to preserve the differences between each game's physics or combine all of it into one single thing. However, when players who were used to the current game's physics tried playing older titles, they really struggled. Upon seeing this, the developers decided to carry over New Super Mario Bros. U's physics into all of the games. Now, one feature the team added was different level themes. For example, ground, underwater, castle, However, some of the level styles had never existed in the original games. There were no ghost house levels in Super Mario Bros, and no airship levels in Super Mario World, for example. New graphics would have to be created for these. This was the same for enemies, too. However, according to Tezuka, this turned out to be a little more difficult than expected. In his words, we have a lot of really gifted 3D computer graphic designers, but there are not a lot of people who still do pixel art. To use a limited colour palette and few pixels, when today you can do whatever you want, it took quite a bit of discipline. It was quite a challenge for us. Of course, it wasn't only new art that had to be created. The game needed a whole bunch of new music. And since this game was focused on the classic Mario games of yesteryear, who else could they enlist as composer than the great that is Koji Kondo, composer for Mario 1, 2, 3, World? Yeah, you get the idea. Now, going back and revisiting all of his old music proved to be an interesting experience for Kondo. As he put it, I look back and I really think that each song has its own specific set of memories for me. While I'm working on music that is based on some of these original songs, I kind of harken back to the days when I was working on that and revisit the things that I wanted to do at the time I was creating each piece of music. Now, it wasn't just a few extra songs here and there to fill in the gaps that Kondo ended up composing. No, it was decided that each level theme would have a corresponding song that played while you were editing the level. Now, for some of these themes, Kondo would go back to the original idea he had and expand upon it using the new capabilities afforded to him by modern game music technology. In other cases, he would take the theme in a completely new direction. In any case, Kondo had a lot of fun. And with that complete, Mario Maker was almost done. Oh, but before the game launched, the team made one last change. Their original name for the game, as shown off at E3 2014, was Mario Maker. However, since then they'd added a bucket load of new stuff to the game. To reflect this change, plus to clarify that users were creating Super Mario Bros levels, not levels from like Mario Bros the arcade game, the team updated the game's name to Super Mario Maker. Snazzy. And so, on the 10th of September 2015, Super Mario Maker was released unto the world. How did people react? Well would be an understatement. 
it became a phenomenon, spawning thousands upon thousands of videos online. <coughs> Plus, the game went on to sell 4 million copies, considering the fact that the Wii U which Mario Maker was released on only sold 13 million units, that means that roughly 3 in 10 people who could have bought the game did so. That's pretty impressive. Now, where did the Super Mario Maker series go from there? Well, a port of the game was released for the 3DS at the end of 2016. Bewilderingly though, the online elements of the game had been completely cut, replaced with a lacklustre street pass integration, which meant that you could play courses made by people right next to you in real life. Like your neighbour? Still, with this shockingly bad decision not going to get them down, Nintendo announced a long-awaited sequel coming to Nintendo Switch this year, coming out on the 28th of June 2019. From the looks of it, this game will be even more stuffed with cool objects, new themes, and music. Plus, it'll add a multiplayer mode too. Exciting stuff. So, it's looking like the future of the Mario Maker series is bright. Still, the new game better have some good old fly swatting action, or I'll be an unhappy lad. Oh, and before you go, if people end up enjoying this video, I have a few more Mario Maker related tidbits that I'd love to share. So, if you want to hear about some of them, be sure to share this video with your friends. You know, I think I'm becoming more and more shameless as time goes by. Uh, and if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. And if you really love me, ring the notification bell. Thanks a bunch, I'll see you next week.